Hey guys, I'm here at the Mega Cruise and I decided to do a special interview here and uh, I have the Simply Red, uh, uh, what's your name? Here I am. Uh, you don't know, we don't know the name of the Simply Red guy. Actually, but no, no one knows the name of no. Simply Red. They could be Simply Red. Simply is... Red, but it's not. We have here Antoine Mohemi, de Mohemi. I just did an interview for his channel, Duke TV. But then I decided to do an interview for my channel and I don't know what he's gonna ask me. So Antoine um, was there at the first Angra show in Paris in 95. I met him in 1996 when Angra played in Paris and we recorded a live album called Holy Live. I remember we met yes. at the dressing room. We met several times throughout the years. I even don't know which show we've been, but the Maybe thing sure. is, uh, which is cool, the fans become friends, which is re really cool. And now he's here at the Mega Cruise to cover the whole event. And I said, why don't you ask me questions representing all the fans? Because you've been you know, watching my concerts, Angra concerts, Megadeth concerts, yeah. listening to my guitar clinics, the, the acoustics we did at, at the Mega stores back in the day. He's going to ask me questions. I don't know but kind of uh, because he knows the whole history True. from the band, you know, from the European perspective, from the French perspective, right? That's what's interesting because, of course, you have all the Brazilian fans who I think have a completely different vision and history of that about your no. career and your growing yeah. up. It's in France, as far as I remember, back in 1994 when Angel's Cry was released, you had to get the news from the newspapers and you only uh -huh. get maybe one or two articles about the bands. Yeah. And what was funny is the way Angra was introduced to the French audience, yeah, I think the European it? audience. How was it? It was always like a new uh, Halloween-like band oh. incorporating classical stuff. That was I see. in the beginning. Okay. And nobody knew if it was going to be like an up-and-coming band. Another German comp yeah. kind of band. And but then it was really weird because you were coming up from Brazil and at the time I think there was o only Sepultura, Sepultura which yeah, was quite famous and yeah. which was a really different kind of yeah. music. But yeah. then people get to know and to see on stage because there was a kind of real promotion from the French company. Yeah. And then we went to the La Loco, La Loco at the first concert. And I remember I had like this um, N4 washboard guitar and it was the headstock. That's the only thing I remember from that show. It's kind of a traditional venue, but it's not a big venue, maybe a thousand people, 800 people, I guess. Actually, the funny thing is it was, it, it still is a nightclub. It is a nightclub. So the bands had to wait until 1, ah, to play. 1 13 a.m. Yeah. In, in, in the night to play. And the show ended at like 3 a.m. Because it's for us from Brazil, it was different because it, was, it is kind of the Pigalle. Yeah. It's kind of a red light street, kind of a ripper. Straight burn. under the Moulin Rouge, you can see. The Moulin Rouge, the famous Moulin Rouge. It's, yeah, it's like, yeah, same place. And for us, first time in Paris, straight to the Moulin Rouge area, Pigalle, all, the, all those people selling drugs, you know. Plus, you right? play that light. So like, and we stay in the hotel there. It was a pretty good hotel from Anton. You know, we were. I don't know, 23 years old. And uh, so I remember like with that guitar, with the headstock, inverted headstock, and then Andre Matos, the singer, he couldn't see anything because he has like these thick glasses, but during the show, he didn't use it. He didn't use also uh, contact lens. So he was just running around. We have to get out of his way. And then suddenly I hit him <laughs> with my guitar. And the rest of the tour, he had like this Band-Aid <laughs> that was fun. That's the only thing I remember. And from you, the show. Played anyway. what, you played one of the first versions of Nothing to Say. I think the lyrics. Were yeah, we did it well because we did a European tour. And then after this small European tour, the idea was to go to Germany to record Holy Land. And then we were playing only Nothing to Say. We we're just trying the song Nobody Knew. It was a different riff. Maybe cool. probably different lyrics. I think it was not the yeah. proper lyrics. For sure, maybe not even like whatever. Again, you know, no, no lyrics. <laughs> Do you remember in the afternoon you went to uh, a record store called La FNAC? La FNAC, yeah. And you did the Famous. special show in acoustic. Was the one that was recorded yeah. or released? Then we didn't know. So we just went there for, for an acoustic version of the songs, but we were making fun, playing flamenco or whatever, singing La FNAC acoustic was released. And I said, oh no, it was just a 
No, it was we're just having fun, but it was cool. The vibe was cool, yeah. So it was the same day. It was the same day. In the afternoon you played there, I and on the night. I remember that. And, oh. and again, it was awesome because from a band coming out of nowhere, like a couple, yeah. a couple of months. But before, uh, there was a lot of people at the final. It was packed. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah. Just the year after you released Holy Land, which was of course a big success in France with the bonus CD, the live acoustic. Oh yeah, the idea because oh yeah, it was a very good idea for you guys that didn't live in the '90s. The record company, now I remember, I kind of try to remember. Finac was the uh, huge store, it was a big chain. So the record company, Olivier Garnier, decided, well, if I recorded their playing at the Finac, I can add the second uh, bonus CD and then only for the Finac store. Now you're saying that, True, I remember. It was... So, so it was the double CD, the Holy Land CD, was shaking now, huh? It's good. Huh? Sometimes you just get drunk. <laughs> <like this. laughs> so it was like a yeah, it was the Holy Land CD, and another CD with that acoustic only for Finac. So he was pretty smart because then Finac, of course, bought lots of yes. Holy Land because they would get the the press people got to buy the French edition because of this. The CD French album. edition, the whole world I wanted to have Japan, the collectors and I think stuff. You couldn't get this one in Japan, so people had to buy it in France. Exactly. Yeah. That was a nice Smart. They had Smart a really, way. really great guy working for the French market. And did some yeah, the Olivier Gar Gar yeah. Garnier did a great way, stuff. Yeah. I think a lot of ideas really ahead of his time or, or getting ideas from bigger bands. And then we we're just starting. He, he did found his way to make it happen for younger bands too. And like in, in France, just in like maybe the course of four or five years, he brought you to some amazing level yeah, and yeah. up to the Zenith. We'll get yeah. talk afterwards. We would like to, to tell everybody, we would like to thank a lot for all the big support that the French people are giving us. It's something very, very impressive for us and we are really very, very happy that that's happening here. So, I'm going to be here pretty soon. <laughs> And then you played at the Aqua Boulevard, which was supposed to be a full-length live recording. And then you were like unhappy with the equipment or the sound, uh, which is why there's just four it was five like songs. EP. It was an EP, mm -hmm. yeah. Now because the quality you were playing out great, whatever you could do as some bands they do, they, they re-record the whole thing, get only the audience, <laughs> all the rest is all re-recorded. But we didn't do that, so I, we chose the best played ones and some uh, feedbacks. Actually, you can hear some feedbacks on the exactly. on the album, but not much. And you kept doing so many signing sessions everywhere in France, everywhere you went. Oh, like, yeah, you you met so many people. Traveling, and and yeah. the cool thing is, you were quite accessible to the fans. Uh, yeah. André spoke really good French at the yeah, time. Yeah. You didn't speak French yet, no, I think, no, or just no, English. No, no. And what I loved it... I was very shy. And when, but when you I was very shy. Videos, I was just like playing guitar. <laughs> And yeah, we didn't speak much English, you know, we didn't have the experience of traveling. So we have only the English that we learned at school and uh, that was it, you know. And then Andrea was very good communicator. So he was always, you know, taking the lead and talking. So it was always, always great. Yeah, I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea was the face of the band because he was always, since he was well talkative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for yeah. a long time, many people thought he was the only guy maybe songwriting, yeah, yeah. doing all the stuff, and you guys were maybe slightly, slightly in the background. Yeah, huh? but actually the whole, the songwriting, managing the band, the whole thing around the band was, yeah, everybody was kind of working on that, you know. We could show that when Andre left, that we kept doing amazing stuff. But many know. people thought you couldn't survive without Andre. That was the most impressive move. Yeah, people, because, yeah. People don't don't, yeah. don't know. And you came back with, but just to go back a, a, a little earlier, after Holy Land, Holy Life, you did many many touring, many festivals. Yeah. Holy Land was a big thing for in France too, mm -hmm. in Europe in general, because and of the the mix with the Brazilian culture. Yeah, and what we learned afterwards is between Holy Land and Fireworks, you guys thought about splitting up, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. No, Andrea wanted to leave the band. After after Holy Land, he was so successful. Yeah, yeah but he just want to quit. You know, I don't know. He do want to do the basic stuff like going. I want to do a solo career. You know, I don't need those guys. You know, very basic. You know, <laughs> as history tells us. Were you yeah. worried or? Uh, no, then the band was pretty much together. And he want to leave. Then he left for a while. So actually, this uh, the Olivier Garnier, the French guy. He came to Brazil. He kind of put me and Andre together in a restaurant, and then we talked and 
Canandra was convinced to stay and then we did fireworks the next album which was not as successful as the Holy Land or even the other ones probably because of this vibe you know but well, most of you guys keep saying you don't like the album that much but for me I still think it's like a real move because it was much more uh... no there was many things there because of that time I was the bands were getting too we wanted to be classical but like real I don't know and we didn't want to go that far so we kind of went back to the more traditional metal with orchestra and that's why we got uh, Chris Sangarit um, to produce we went to London and then yeah then we did the Les Zenith concert that was huge, that was for, huge. People, for people who don't know Les Zenith it's kind of like a one the of the biggest, biggest venue you can have in Paris. Yeah. There's another one called Bercy, which is like... Kind yeah, of it's just the biggest city. venue before you go yeah. to, a, to a stadium. But for that, for like being able to do the locomotive yeah. in 95, and just four years later... They to be like 6,000 like, people. It's not a virus opening for us. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was amazing. Bruce Dixon came, flew. He was not in Iron Maiden. And then Bruce Dixon came and sang two songs. Because believe it or not, people told Bruce Dixon that it would be good for him to be in Angry Show for his people career. People wouldn't believe that now, but yeah. it was true. Like yeah, people said uh, if you have to come to to the Angry Show, and because it's gonna be good for your solo career, and then he came, and then he sang two Maiden songs with us. Yeah, it was amazing, amazing show. And then we have this guy spitting fire in the beginning of the show, uh, because the name of the album was Fireworks. So again, we have this idea of putting this guy speeding fire. The only thing we didn't know was they were speeding kerosene, right? And it was super slippery. So when we started the first song of this massive show, and it was so slippery, and, and then the, the, the whole crew took the carpet out, like in the first song or something. That's what I remember. I have to watch the videos because that's why I remember. What was impressive from a fan point of view is at the end of the shows, usually you guys just switched instruments. Oh yeah, and you we played like some. cover songs. And cover, yeah, we did Force. Judas Priest, uh, ACDC. It was fun. You played the drums. Uh, I was playing drums. Uh, uh, Ricardo was playing guitar. Uh, back, uh, he was practicing guitar. And singing. I think he sang Ricardo back in black. Sang wow. back in black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was cool. It's fun. Well, not only cool, but for for fans to see like a brilliant musician. That like we are able to you, play. because you guys were all ultra talented. But they didn't know we were always choosing the, the easiest <laughs> song ever. <laughs> they think <laughs> we're not, you know, swapping places and uh, playing drink theater. I think Andrew we were like playing like yeah. Judas Priest, uh, I don't know, uh, Back in Black. You, you know, played, cool songs, but not so complicated. Did Gods of Metal in Italy. Italy, Milano. Yeah. And that was huge as well. That was See cool. You. Yeah. Manowar was the main. Yes. And because you're a fan of Manowar. Andre was a huge fan of Manowar. I hope. Andre, yeah, yeah. I hope That's he right. wasn't disappointed yeah, to meet. The... Because sometimes when you meet your idols, you can get disappointed. I didn't meet the guys, but uh, I remember Manowar was really putting down everybody, like not giving no no lights. Imagine a show with like 20% of the lights that you can see uh, that you have it there, and then also the volume. So I didn't like it much because of that. Yeah. Announcement. Announcement now. Somebody's gonna play now. And then Angra was very interesting back then. I don't know if he, Ricardo was playing, but he was playing with the Speedos. So I had the drummer, like almost naked, with his hairy chest, playing Speedos. I was normal, normally like normal black. I was kind of average. Raphael was more hippie with like a colorful, the big sun, bandana. colorful shirt, bandana, you know that. And then Andre was like with this fluffy white shirts, like feeling like Louis XIV, <laughs> like, like a prince. And then Louis was like this camouflage kind of guy, beard. And the, the band was very different. And then not because we were planned, just because we were like very different from each other. You're gonna be successful to the point you can handle success. And the band couldn't handle this success, you know? The result was we cannot handle success and uh, we split. I think when you came back with Edu, it was like so surprising and so powerful because you just brought new musicians. Yeah. Like uh, Aquiles on the drums and Felipe. Great musicians, they're all. So you, them, yeah. you brought new songwriting skills. We could show that we were also, you know, writing this yeah. stuff. That was a, a big thing for me because I went full on 
to learn how to program and, and all the sample things about the equipment. I didn't know. I was not doing it all before. But the music is here. So once you have it, you have it. Doesn't matter. You know, you can start doing all orchestration and stuff. And it was challenging, but it was really good. Hard work, by the way. And Rebirth, yeah, was quite powerful. And you kept doing like a huge, extensive tour in Europe. Oh, yeah. And you can really, you put your property. Then music. Temple of Shadows. And then 2008, I was in Japan for a big festival, Loud Park. So Angra was pretty big. Megadeth was the headliner. We were, I think, playing just before Megadeth. And then I was invited to do a front cover of the Burn magazine with Dave Mustaine. So that was the first time I met him. Of course, when he called me for to join Megadeth, he didn't remember. The, <laughs> was just another picture for him. But for me, of course, uh, was an important moment for my career because to be in a cover, on the cover with Dave Mustaine was a was a, one of my uh, the highlights of the career, right? So sure. And what struck me back then is that Andre was kind of the leader before he was in Negra. But then I think you. And he was the leader for the fans. He was not the leader inside the band. Yeah. Why, would the you say, why would you say that? That he was. Because leadership is not. It's different than being the singer, the lead singer. You need to have other kinds of skills to to be a leader. First, you have to work hard, harder than everybody in the room. So were you angry yeah. that you kept, you kept some of the lights for him? Um, no, no, because I, I believe. If you see in the early, early days, I was shy there. Being a leader doesn't mean that you're the only one that is dictating the rules. Yeah. It's just like the kind of the person that helps to lead the band somewhere and then put everybody together, put everybody to do their best. I like management. I like the business side of music, That's you know? You, you the and then I was, yeah, I slowly I was kind of learning and uh, talking to the record companies and having the friendship with Olivier Garnier in, in France or in the guys from Japan, the guys from Germany or whatever. Now, what yeah. would you say is like your biggest regret in your whole times with Angra? The biggest regret, I think, I think the regret is not being able to manage, you know, different people to keep going to a one, one goal. We did that for nine years, which is, you know, was longer than the Beatles, <laughs> That's true. right? So it was more than the That's Beatles, not, not as successful as the Beatles, but it was longer because it proved that it's very hard to keep four or five people together for the same uh, goal. Not that many bands can come up with a stronger lineup than the previous one the and change line. singers, especially yeah, since it was harder. kind of iconic and yeah. created again with Edu yeah. after four albums. Yeah. That was surprising as well because uh, again, it seemed like a good, solid band. Because it's the same thing as Fireworks. Uh, Edu wanted to do like his solo career. And then it's normal, like you, you have a group of people, at some point you think, well, I can't do my stuff without these people. You know, that happened to Iron Maiden, that happened to Black Sabbath, that happened to many people. Was it an obvious choice to bring Fabio singing, or was it like complicated to find him or to think about Well, the Fabio was a, was a different story, because then we were like, oh, we're gonna have have a third singer it's gonna be weird. We're trying to talk to Andre, but Andre always said no. We did a crew seventy thousand tons of metal, and then we called Fabio, you know, as a guest singer. And then the promoters, they said the in South America, can I buy that concert with Fabio? Because Fabio was a, he's a well-known singer, True. Fabio Leone. Paulo Baron, it was a, the, the guy in, in Brazil, the manager. So he put some shows together uh, in Brazil. Angra guest Fabio Leone. And then after, I don't know, w one year of doing this, like, I guess you're in the band. Actually, he was playing with Angra, opening Angra in the early 90s, you know, in, in when we used to play in Italy. So he knew the band, he liked the band, we liked him, so it was kind of just happened, you know. You waited quite a long time before doing your first solo record, I think it was in 2005 for No Gravity? Yeah, I did a solo album, yeah, and 2005, yeah. Which was kind of heavy metal stuff with some Brazilian parts? Yeah, yeah, it was more like a guitar player thing. I didn't want to do like a, an Angra thing or with a singer. Some artists sometimes they do a solo album, they kind of do the same thing they do in their band. And for me, it sounds like they don't like the band. They want to do try something by themselves. They call a solo album. I was always passionate about all the, those 80s guitar players. Satriani, Steve Vai, uh, Jason Becker, uh, Mark Friedman. 
you name it, Greg Howe, Vinnie Moore, and I loved all those albums. So I wanted to do a, an album like that, you know? So the one you did was Universal Universal? Yeah, then I did really a Brazil. Really different. Very different. So I was trying to do a solo career as a solo career, not because Angra was my band and the solo career was different stuff that, I, well, instrumental stuff. I That when the, the Fabio thing happened, like the going to the cruise and then maybe, I moved to the United States because Angra is kind of stopping somehow. Uh, fading down, I don't know. And then I got a call from Dave Ellison, Dave Mustaine asking me to join Megadeth. There's no audition actually, but the first thing I did after telling my wife was to call the guys. You know, Raphael, actually Raphael didn't answer because it's always hard to get me to. Uh, anyway, so I talked to Felipe, I talked to the manager then, uh, to Raphael, maybe the next day. And then all of them said, like, of course, you, you have to do it, you know, and uh, it's a great opportunity. So when I got the blessing from them, I was excited uh, to, do, to go to Tennessee, Nashville, to talk to Dave Mustaine, and then the whole thing happened. Then I stayed a month uh, in Nashville doing pre-production and recordings, and straight from Nashville, I went to Japan to play with Angra, because that year we had a lot of stuff booked. And then we did Rock in Rio in 2015. We thought, oh, that's the best time to say, oh, that's the, my last show, Rock in Rio. I mean, not the last show, but the last show of this, uh, this moment in my life. I never know if I can play, well, we're gonna play with them again, of course. That was kind yeah, of cool it's Marcel. So we used the, the Rock in Rio, which is a big festival, to have this transition. And I think it was a, it was a great idea. This guy here. Aquele cara ali, brasileiro, do Angra, vai representar o Brasil no Mega 10, caralho! Yeah, and, but the main thing is, I, I still have this friendship, you know? I'm, I'm kind of part of the band, I'm not on stage, but I still feel like Whenever they need me, uh, I, I do like regular phone calls with them. You still play with uh, Bruno and Felipe? Okay. And I pray, I, yes. Uh, Bruno just uh, recorded the, the drum from my new solo album. Uh, Felipe always played my, my solo stuff when I do my trio shows. You know, because Bruno was playing with me before Angra, and I told the Angra guys, look, Bruno is like fantastic, he can play anything. You know, we might, you, you guys should call him. And what's funny is you got married with a Finnish woman. Yeah, yeah. But yet you decided to move to the U.S. Yeah. The thing was, I decided to move to the U.S. kind of first, and then it took a while, you know, to get all the paperwork done. It was kind of one year and a half or something. In this period, <laughs> I got married and had a baby. And then, um, you know, so like, should I move or not? Should I, should I go still now to California? or should I stay in Finland or stay in Brazil because now I have a baby. But we all decided, okay, let's let's do it. And then we moved. Because yeah. your wife is a musician too. I think you She's a musician the, too, she's yeah. a pianist, yeah. You play with yeah. Tarja? Tarja. Tarja. We, we played with Tarja together for, for a month. <laughs> and then my life changed. Now I have three kids, 10, 10 years later. And, and I think one of your Daughters. Yeah, my uh, She became quite famous with your some video. I don't know about the being famous. Yeah. So I, I got this email. Oh, in 15 days we're gonna play in Quebec with Megadeth. Uh, it was just a festival invitation from a big festival, Festival de Té, and then they accepted and said. Suddenly I had to learn 20 songs, like the old the back catalog, right? The old songs, and then I was touring with Angra. So I had like during the traveling in Brazil, like listening to the Megadeth, learning the songs. Then I came home after this long period of recording Dystopia, going to Japan, being in Brazil, I wanted to stay with my daughter and my family, but I had to practice the show that was coming up. I was practicing and uh, like I was, and my daughter was like, oh, that's monster music. And then I said, okay, let's play monster music. I was like playing Megadeth to, to rehearse and shows like, yeah, playing monster music. You know, parents, we think that everything is great. Things that our kids do, we think is great. So I put my phone and I, I filmed for me, as we, I do a lot, film moments at home, 
But then I decided to post that because I, I, I cut it some parts and decided to post it because I thought it was cool. Parenting and practicing and all that. You know, I did all the, maybe one or two videos with my daughter. And then one day I was doing some interviews and I decided to do an interview with her too, you know. And then I changed my mind. The video is still, the interview I, I, it's private now. I thought it was better and then some other, I was reading about it. My wife doesn't like it. We discovered that my daughter doesn't like it. She was four you're or the, five you're years. You're the dad rocker, so when you come to pick up your daughter at school, yeah, you see the guy with long hair. It's kind yeah, of but unusual. Everywhere, you know, there are a lot of cool parents there because we live in LA. You know, yeah, we have like the, the her biggest friend, the father is the Simpsons director. Yeah, so yeah, there's other guy, the, the, the writer from Aquaman, and there's like a lot of cool people there. All the movie industry. So there's a lot of musicians and artists at the school, so it's pretty nice. I'm just a guitar player. <laughs> but actually here at the cruise, somebody came to me and was like, thank you for showing the dads how to raise the kid. It's great videos because it's, you, we can see that you love your, your child and, and the way you interact. She's doing music with you or pretending she's doing music with you. So I get compliments because of that, but at the same time, I don't know if, if she's gonna like it, so it's kind of, it's kind of a conflict, yeah, you know, so I have to wait a little bit. And maybe one last thing is the emotional video you did about Andre passing away. Yeah. And many fans keep asking because they cannot believe that you guys didn't even talk or meet or met for 20 years. Yeah, 20 years, but actually I never counted the years. But when Andre passed away, it's like, let me see, the last time I met him, it's like, uh, I think it was in 99, when it was the band split. For fans, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable, even for me. And then like, the, kind of the awkward thing was, he, he got married and moved to Sweden. Yeah. And then he had a, had a kid in Sweden, and it was like, I was, I was in Finland, which is like, I mean, from outside Sweden, Finland is almost the same thing, kind of. I'm sorry, the Finns, and anyways. Okay, the band split, you know, and then he went to do his stuff that he wanted, and, and then me and Rafael, we had this very hard moment, very difficult to, what are we gonna do now? We know we can do songs, we can compose songs, and then finding, finding new people, trying to talk to the record companies again, what are we gonna do, how are we gonna invest and pay the whole thing to keep up? in the same level, so it was, a, it was a lot of work, so years goes by. We started doing the new Angra, let's say, and uh, and you're not gonna be coming back to your, your old girlfriend, hey, let's have dinner, you know? You can try, but then... You can try, but then you're gonna destroy the new stuff. Some heavy guitars going on. So if you're talking to the old members, well, what, what I'm doing here? So you're gonna create a conflict, and then, five, six, seven, eight years, three albums with the guys. And then after we started trying to make contact again, but he never wanted. So, but we, every time we had a chance, we would send a message. You know, if, if Andrea want to do something, whatever it is, maybe a barbecue or, or like a one concert or something, let's talk, you know? Let's imagine you could have made a real reunion. Yeah, Andre. like a reunion. Was it, was it possible with your old schedule now with Mega? Because you are quite busy as well. I mean, you can always do a, a concert. You, you don't need to book a full five years tour. We could uh, let's do like one concert reunion. Let's do one festival. That would be possible. That's why he said, "Okay, I'm ready to do it." And if Kiko is in, the you know the week before he died, it took him 20 years also to to come into terms of the, the whole situation, you know. But you told me you didn't uh, see Andre yet. You saw him live with his next band. I saw him live, uh, the first uh, DVD they did with uh, Shaman. I did, I went to, to see because what's this new band they have? And then I went to the concert and I saw some stuff. I was listening to the albums to know, you know, because it was not only Andre. We're talking a lot about Andre, but Ricardo, Luis and Andre. So I wanted to know, it was kind of, Okay, they're doing this, we're going we're gonna to do something else, you know, at, at least in the first years. Then we, I didn't care much, you know, I didn't follow his solo career and stuff. 
No, it was my pleasure. So have fun. And it was then, a pleasure yeah, to talk to you. Thanks a lot for being with us um, so many years. Yeah, we can't wait and to hear the new solo album. Of album? course, the Vegas yeah. yeah. album as well. At, at some point next year, yes. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. All right, so let's enjoy the view now.